This morning, we're going to break from our study in the book of Titus. We're going to look at a passage to kind of bring our conference to a close and encourage our hearts with what to do with what all we've heard this weekend. So if you would turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, one of the best parts of preaching at the end of a conference is everybody already said what you were going to say. And uh, in Sunday school, he opened up 2 Corinthians 5 and started teaching it. And so we're going to look at the same thing. It's too late to change. Uh, Ray and I met for lunch. We were at Maggiano's, believe it or not. And we wanted to conclude with really a message on the Great Commission. So we wanted to set before your minds and hearts the purpose that God has left for His church. And so I want to read you some of Jesus' parting words before He ascended to the right hand on high where He sits even this morning. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, just listen. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. In Acts 1.7 As Jesus was departing, he said to his apostles, It is not for you to know the times or the epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the remotest parts of the earth. And after he said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him up from their sight. And so in light of the finished work then of Jesus Christ, He died and He was buried and He was raised from the dead. He now gives the church her orders to testify to those around us in our communities, our nations, and to the ends of the earth of the salvation that is in Jesus Christ alone. That is why we are here In heaven, there will be no more evangelism. It will be done. It will cease. Now is the time of the ingathering, the harvest. This is the time that the nations are coming into the kingdom of God. And so in picking our passage this morning, I chose not to preach on the great commission that was given in the verses that I just read, but I feel that there's a passage that deepens and further explains the great commission to us. What is it that we are to be about? So if you will turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm going to re- begin reading just in verse 16. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know Him in this way no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore... We are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Let's pray. Father, we come before you, and I thank you for the words that are before us this morning. God, they are full and they are rich. And so I pray that your spirit would teach the minds and the hearts of your people. God, that you would meet us in a special way and that no one would walk out of this room without realizing they're ambassadors for this ministry of reconciliation. God, awaken us from the dead, awaken us from sleep, awaken us to slothfulness, to coldness towards those who need to be reconciled to the living God. Let all excuses die this morning before the throne of God. Father, do your work in hearts that are ready to open up and to receive this word of God into it. Lord, change our hearts. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So the mandate that has been given to every Christian is to engage in the ministry of reconciliation. 
The word reconciled in verses 18 through 21, it's used five times. Five times. Look in verse 18. Now, all these things are from God who reconciled us to Himself. Uh, Through Christ, He gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 19, that God was in Christ reconciling. At the end of that verse, He's committed to us the word of reconciliation. So we are begging people to be reconciled to God. So it's really not tricky to figure out then what is Paul after in this section of Scripture that we're going to study. We have been given the ministry of reconciliation. And so the first thing I want to do is to define what is reconciliation. The word means to restore broken relationships. It is a relationship that's been estranged or alienated, and we have to reconcile that broken relationship. It's a friendship that has been marred, and we need to bring it back together. So an important aspect to this term is that it implies that we were in a very good relationship, and now it's gone bad. And now that bad relationship is going to be gone good. It's going to be reconciled. It's going to be brought back together. And so this term, reconciliation, it really carries with it a term of relationship, uh, personal dealings, fellowship, favor, intimacy. It's a very warm term. It's to be brought back into communion and deepness and oneness, as this term would imply. An interesting example uh, it's a strange one. In Luke 23, as I was studying, Pilate, uh, is, is Jesus is brought to Pilate, and he listens to Jesus. And then he sends, Pilate, he sends Jesus over to Herod. And Herod and all the soldiers, they mock him, and they ridicule him, and put on the crown of thorns, and all of that. And then Herod sends him back to Pilate. And in Luke 23, 12, it says, Now Herod and Pilate became friends with one another that very day. For before they had been at enmity with each other. And so their relationship was one of enmity. And this day of their kind of coming together, being cohorts and killing Jesus, they became friends that day. And so what I'd like to do then is seek to study and learn what is this ministry of reconciliation that's been given to us, the bride of Christ? What what does it mean when Paul calls us to this ministry? Here's your outline for this morning The first part, we'll understand then what is the work of reconciliation, and then our second point will be then what is the ministry of reconciliation. The word of reconciliation, I want you to look into the first heading, is just the necessity of it. In verse 19 of chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians, uh, it says that he's reconciling the world to himself. This statement implies that there's something wrong between God and man. There's a a separation, a break. But more than that, there's alienation and there's hostility. Romans 8 says there's enmity. There's, There's an enmity in the hearts that have separated God and man, which is why we're just a big bundle of messes. This is why the world is the way that it is. There is enmity between God and man. If you watch the news, why is the world this way? Why am I this way? Here's the answer. There's enmity between you and the living God. Yet as this term implies, this is not how it was originally in God's created order and His design. There was fellowship and enjoyment between God and man, Adam and God. There was shalom. There was peace. There was wellness. There was relationship. The Scriptures don't tell us how long Adam enjoyed this fellowship with God. But it does tell us that Adam and Eve sinned against God. And in that day you will surely die and they broke that relationship, and that relationship of oneness has now turned in to enmity. There's an awful alienation. God comes in the garden, and Adam begins to hide. God drives Adam out from the garden in his presence. And everyone who has ever been born of Adam now has gone with him. We come into this world estranged and separated from God. It's as if those babies are crying because they know we are separated from God. Alienation. In the heart of Adam, God was Adam's enemy. And in the heart of God, I want you to hear this, Adam was God's enemy. There is enmity between God and man. And so why is there this enmity against man? It's very simple. I could describe it in one word. It's sin. It's sin that brings enmity between God and man. It is sin that provokes God. God is a holy 
God, a blazing, infinitely holy God that no one can look into his presence and not be consumed. He's holy and he's a just God who must punish sin. God hates sin. It brings a holy revulsion to God wherever he finds sin. Sin is the problem of the universe. It's not global warming. It is not terrorism. It's not bigotry. It's not the sexuality issues of our day or redefining marriage or materialism. It's not liberalism. The problem of our universe is sin. And God is angry against sin. Wherever he finds it, he must punish it or he's not God. This holy, just God must punish sin. And so here's the million-dollar question. If there's an enmity between me and God, I just love self. I'm born into this world. I'm a slave to it. Your very nature is self. And that's your problem is you're, you're a slave and you're in bondage to self. And God's very character is holy and just. He can never look at sin and have fellowship with it. I'm by nature stuck. I'm under His wrath. I can't get out of my nature. I can't change it. I can't fix my record. And I've got this holy and just God. And I want fellowship. I want intimacy. I've been made for this God. I will never be happy until I'm brought back safely into the presence of God. So how can God deal with us and me not be consumed in this blazing fire of holiness? How can I have reconciliation if sin is the issue? Because I've sinned in large quantities. I will today and I will tomorrow. I am at cold war with God in my humanness. There's a cold war. So what is the answer of every false religion, what we've heard all weekend and what we've heard everywhere we go? Every false religion says then you've got to do something to appease God. You have to fix God's heart towards you. And you've got to go do, there's a million different lists and things that you must do to get God appeased. And I'll tell you right now, that is the exact wrong answer. That will never appease God and that will never fix the enmity that's in your own heart. You will clean up and you will do offer thing after thing and it will never fix your problem. I want you to consider the nature then of God's work. There is an absolute necessity of reconciliation And the way it will be fixed is by the nature of God's work. The Scriptures declare to us He will remove it. God will deal with sin. He will never overlook it. I'm going to ask you this morning to never hope for that. Don't you dare sit with peace this morning thinking that God will just overlook your sin and ignore it. It would be impossible for God to do that. He'd have to violate His very character and being. I've got a much better answer for you this morning. Look with me in verse 18 of chapter 5. And I want you to see God's answer. Now all these things are for God, from God, who reconciled us to himself. How did he do that? Through the instrument of Christ. Look at verse 19. Namely, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And in verse 21, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus Christ is the instrument. Jesus Christ is the person that the Father would use to bring about a reconciliation between God and man so that we might have favor and friendship and fellowship with the living God. Jesus Christ is God's instrument to bring about reconciliation. There is no way to approach him. And many people are trying other ways. But you need a mediator. And there's only one mediator between God and man, Christ Jesus. There is no other name under heaven by which a man can be saved. This is the only way that God has given to fix this enmity and bring about reconciliation, to commune and dwell with the living God. Look with me in verse 19. How is he going to do this? 
namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. That has been the glory of this conference. I heard it again and again, not counting their trespasses against them. I will not count their sins against them as the declaration of the living God. And the question is, and how? I want that. I don't want my sins counted against me. Oh God, how do we get this? God cannot just sweep them under the carpet. He can't just take all of your sins and sweep them and ignore them. He can't say, let bygones be bygones. Maybe I'm just overreacting a little bit to sin. God can't say that. Maybe I just need to do some penance and God will forgive me. No, every sin must be dealt with. Yet he says here, I will not count your trespasses against you. So every sin is going to be dealt with. And here's this promise to every heart here this morning. God saying, I will not count your trespasses against you. That word means to, to put to your account. They will not be put to your account. You won't have to deal with them. They are going to be removed. Every sin must be dealt with. But there's only one way that God could ever do this. And he has to do it by way of a substitute. He has to do it by a substitute uh, to count these transgressions against another because they've got to be dealt with. They can't be ignored. And I want you to see the answer to this dilemma and this beautiful problem. And this is our hope and our joy and why we live and why we are ambassadors. Listen to verse 21. This is what God did. He made him, Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He reckoned my sins to Christ. He makes Jesus, it says, to be sin. The sinlessness of Christ, he knew no sin. He was holy and righteous and good and innocent without blemish. We love the Gospels to just watch the glory of God portrayed in the Son of God. And all I see is righteousness on every page. Everything He did, say, prayed, it was just righteousness. It was glorious and brilliant. There was no sinful thought or deed or motive ever in the heart mind of Jesus Christ. From the inside to the outside, there is no stain or blemish in our Lamb. God the Father takes the stainless one, the very perfect Son of God, and our text says He made Him to be sin. It doesn't say He made Him an offering. He made Him sin. He, Jesus had such a complete identification with our sin that He took it upon Himself and He was treated as sin. This is the closest relationship Jesus could have had to sin without himself being sinful. Unbelievable. He came into the position where he so identified with my sin that he had to identify with its punishment and its consequences for sin. He deserved then an alienation and a wrath because of his identification with my sin. He was smitten through for my transgressions. Surely he himself bore my griefs and my sorrows. He bore the wrath of God. And the one thing that God hates is sin. And he became that which God hates. And he became ground zero for the wrath of God. He was just regarded as a mass of sin. And in his body, he received the wrath of God and the alienation and the justice of God. God looked at him not as a sin bearer or an offering, but he looked at him as if he was sin. And he made him to be sin. The most offensive thing in the universe to the Father, Jesus now becomes. God said, where is my wrath to be vented for the sin of my people? And he looked at his son with the accumulation of all of the stain of our sin, the incarnated Son of God, he looked at him as sin so that he would turn his eyes from him. He's too holy to even look upon it, but he wouldn't turn his arrows of justice. He pierced them through for our transgressions. And there's just this hanging carcass on a tree with desertion, forsaking of God and his crushing. 
the wrath of God was poured out every last drop and it was satisfied on Jesus Christ. He propitiated every last drop. Why? No religion has an answer for this but Christianity. It says so that he could not count our trespasses against us. That's why Jesus hung on that cross so that this morning my trespasses could not be counted against me before God. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? So my friends, the glory of Christianity is not us bringing our sacrifices to God to try to appease Him, but God sending His Son to be a sacrifice for us so that we might be reconciled to God. So what is the blessed result of this work? In verse 21, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Jesus becomes sin, what God hates. So we might become the thing that God loves more than anything else besides His Son, righteousness. We, so that we could become righteousness, so identified with righteousness that now God sees us as if we are righteous. He saw His Son as if He was sin. He pierced Him through, and now He sees you, believer in Christ, as righteous. Righteousness, you're so identified with it that God declares you this morning righteous. He makes us righteousness. In Christ, He makes us covered with His merits and all of who He is, His righteousness. Logitza, my credit to your account, put to your account this morning. And now it's as if we have never sinned before God. And I am full of the divine kind of righteousness that God loves, and it overflows my cup because I'm in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He has made, He was made all sin, and we are made all righteousness. This is what we call justification. This is God declaring sinners not guilty because your sins put on Him and His righteousness is put on you. You are not guilty. But I think in our text that this is even more than justification. The context here is not a courtroom. It is not a judge declaring not guilty. Because here we have the satisfaction that Jesus rendered and it brings us into fellowship. This is more of a judge adopting me and bringing me into his family and to favor friendship and saying, I'll give you everything that I have. You're in the family. When I die, you get everything. You're brought in. It's so much bigger than a courtroom. This is familia. This is love. This is family. Reconciliation. I love reconciliation. The deep, deep love of Jesus Christ. God loved us before the foundation of the world in Ephesians 1. But he could not deal with us in sin as unbelievers. His affections have been eternal towards us, but he could not express them in a love relationship until sin was dealt with. And through Jesus Christ, that affection now can be poured out on the children of God. God, now you stand in grace, his favor, reconciliation, it is all yours. We stand in grace in an eternal peace treaty that can never be broken. It's not like these silly ones in the world where they write them and a week later they're shooting each other. You guys are in an eternal peace reconciliation that can never, ever come back. Praise God. And then our second point. Therefore, we have a ministry that the work of reconciliation requires. In verse 18, it says we have a ministry of reconciliation in verse 19, he's committed unto us the word of reconciliation. And in verse 20, he calls us ambassadors. So now God takes the ones that he has reconciled. And in verse 17, therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. We are completely made new in Christ. New creations, new hopes, new desires, new heart, a new spirit. Everything is new in Christ. And those are the ones now that he takes. Look in verse 18. Now all these things, what things? Verse 17, new creations, everything that we have in Jesus Christ, they're from God. We have them from God. 
And so these now are the ones that God entrusts this ministry of reconciliation to. He doesn't give it to the angels. He doesn't give it to others. He gives it to those whom He has reconciled. It is given to reconciled men, women, and children. People who stood in need of this reconciliation. Those who were made aware of their great need of reconciliation. You realize the depth of your enmity toward God. You've realized the depth of God's enmity toward you and your sin. The lack of any possibility to bring peace. You found that. And that, then you heard the message of the gospel that there is peace through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that became a treasure hidden in a field. And you would sell anything that you could have this Christ. And you were healed. And you were reconciled to God. These would be the right ones then to take this message. Because these ones are going to go in earnest. You're going you're gonna to care. You're going to care about people's souls because you've sat on the precipice of where they sit. And you're going to go in love because amazing love that you've received. You are going to love them. You're going to go with compassion. And you're going to have patience to love and persevere and not give up with these people. And you're going to go in truth because that is the only way they can have peace with God. We who enjoy the daily smile and fellowship of God, the redeemed relationship, the reconciled ones, go and tell. What a great plan. You go and tell what you've tasted and received and seen. Who would be better ambassadors than us? Your ambassadors for Jesus Christ. Why these ones? Because you know the misery and the alienation of sin. I drank from its pain and misery for 21 years. Romans 3 says misery and destruction are in their path and the way of peace they have not known. It's just a path of misery and destruction. You might be here this morning and I just described your life. You just keep going, why does everything keep going wrong? Because when you're separated from God, it's just a path of misery and destruction. You can't find peace. That's the path. But we know these mercies day after day after day, they're new every morning. I drink from them every morning. I have new hopes and aims and affections and goals and fellowship. I'm a new creation. Be my representatives then, says God. Be my ambassadors. Take the sovereign's message. You represent God begging men to come to Him. And it's a, broad, it's a broad work. It's for Jew and Gentile. It's for those who are rich and those who are poor. It's for those who are ignorant, for those who are wise, those who are Muslims or those who are Mormons. It's such a broad ministry. Reconciling the world. This message must go to the world. And we are His ambassadors. And we come in Christ's place when we present the gospel. That changed my evangelism. As I am sharing and pleading, I am his ambassador. I'm speaking for Christ. This is why we speak it in truth and love. This is why I show it in truth and love. I heard a man aspiring to ministry, and he said, I, I guess all I can do is preach. And I just tell you, that's all we can do is preach. There's a big difference. And that's all we can do. We can preach this gospel, this message. This is what we're called to. This is our calling. So what is the manner in which we do this? It says God's entreating and we're begging. It has to be an earnest ministry in meekness and in gentleness, but it's earnest. This is not uh, an offer of a blood-bought peace by angry and gnarly people. This is not hard heard this weekend so many times, trying to get a notch in our belt. Just stop if that's your motive. Look at our Christ, meek and gentle, and says, my yoke is easy. Come to me. I love when he says, come, Isaiah, come, let us reason together, weeping over Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Uh, and, and Ezekiel, I take no delight in the death of the wicked. We see the heart of our God. Be willing to beg. The God of the universe begged, and He is begging you through ministers of the gospel as we share this truth. Come with every form of persuasion. 
Speak to the mind, speak to the intellect, speak to the heart, implore them, I beg you. I don't just set out reconciliation to you and say, man, I was faithful. I want you to receive it and I want you to believe upon it. I want you to have it. Do you have earnestness? I wish my heart was as large as God's. Pray, God, enlarge our hearts. He's begging people for this. I had this picture during the conference of of a church with every member engaged in gospel reconciliation, where every one of us dream and serve and sacrifice and pray and give and send and go. And it's just all of us are fully engaged. Why am I still here for the ministry of reconciliation? Give your life to this ministry. Don't spend it on the things that are going to perish. The shame of just studying about reconciliation and being able to debate every doctrine behind it and every nuance and never share it is just wrong. The door is open to the Muslim world as we learned this weekend. And I pray that we'll give our heart, mind, and soul and strength to serve the King of Kings in this. If all we do is have classes on theology of Islam and understand their ways, then shame on us. I pray from this conference we come away going, I want want the ministry of reconciliation, whatever we can do, and seeing Muslims come to Jesus Christ. What is the message? The message is be reconciled to God. Lay down your arms of unbelief and your own agenda and fall on Jesus Christ. Christ, believe in Him, receive Him, surrender to Him. It's a message about Jesus Christ. I want you to think about an illustration as I close out about a king. I want you to picture there's this king. He's he's the greatest military power on all of earth. And he's encamped against a city with a very small army. And they've been stealing from him and assaulting and slandering this king. And the day of reckoning is finally upon this little city. He could take the city with just a little nudge, and he's poised in such power to trounce. And then all of a sudden, a messenger with a white flag is sent from this powerful king, and he comes and it says, lay down your arms, come to my camp, and you won't be tortured. I will forget your offenses against me. I won't count them against you. I'll give you a place of fellowship in my castle. I'll give you all the benefits of my royal family. You will sit at my table. And they they hear this and they shoot the flag carrier who happens to be the prince. And he just keeps sending messenger after messenger begging them to accept his offer. Such a story has never happened in the history of the world. You can read every history book. There's no such thing because it's so bizarre. It's so amazing. You just say it can't happen. It's just too much. But that is the offer. Be reconciled to an offended God this morning. Put down your arms, all your excuses that you sit here with this morning. I was in a church that hurt me. My parents did this. Throw down these excuses before God. Throw down your sin. Quit blaming other people. Lay down your arms to Jesus Christ. Receive the reconciliation that God offers you this morning in the person and in the work of Jesus Christ who hung on a cross for sin. I beg you, as as if God, it's as if God was begging you this morning. Do you hear the voice of God by the Holy Spirit? Stop, repent, and believe, and be reconciled to the sovereign of the universe in a love relationship. As we close the conference, I just have one last closing word is what I've seen is so many in America have been caught up in all the politics and all the things that we hear on a daily basis. And and their enemies have become the Muslims. And their enemies have become homosexuals. And their enemies have become liberals. And, And we've lost the main purpose of why we're here. We're here for the ministry of reconciliation. And by our love, And proclaiming the greatest love that there is. God reconciling the world to himself in Christ Jesus. We've been given the message of reconciliation. And it starts with God. you got to be reconciled to God. So again, repent and believe if you've never had that done. It starts in our marriages. 
I want to advance the kingdom of God while I hate my wife sitting next to me. It starts in families. The kid's so angry at his dad, he can't sit next to him this morning. It starts, the message of reconciliation starts with God, and then it starts moving into our families. And it moves into our relationships in the church or become bitter and hard towards the members and its people. It starts there. And then it goes out to the enemies of God. And we call them to come and be reconciled to God. And they come in the church and they can see what it looks like. What does it look like? We put it on display and we show the world. John MacArthur says, what happens when our mission field becomes our enemies? What happens to the church when the mission field becomes our enemies? This is a ministry of reconciliation. That's what we live for. I pray that we repent of any of that in our heart this morning. God is bringing the nations to our front door and we're hating them. We're listening to CNN instead of God. And we let our nation and our government deal with how to protect the nations from terrorism. But let us deal with how to bring about the ministry of reconciliation that God has given to us. That's what the church is for. And I pray we give our hearts and our lives to this. Join hands. Be his ambassadors as we seek to love this world with the message of reconciliation. It's the reason you're still here on earth. Will you join me as we spend and be spent for that beautiful name that is above every other name? the name of Jesus Christ. Amen? Let's pray. Oh, Father, we thank you for the, the message of reconciliation. God, I thank you for the amazingness that the, the king, the, the righteous one, would send his own son to declare the peace treaty. God, that he would make a way of peace. It is unbelievable. You did this while we were enemies, while we hated you. Lord, this love needs to melt our hearts. It needs to overtake us so that we will become ambassadors for Christ. God, that we will now go with that love that we've received. Lord, all I want to do is reconcile every soul I can till I quit breathing. Lord, give us the heart of Christ. Let us enter into this world with his love, his truth. God, break us down from being gnarly dudes and all the just harshness that surrounds us. Lord, let us lose that and enter in to loving this world with the love of Jesus Christ. God, we have the message above all messages, the only one that can have their trespasses not counted against them on the day of judgment. Oh, God, let that be our joy and our peace, and let it be our motivation. Let it be our strength as we are united and joined to the living Christ. Jesus, we, we thank you that all these blessings come by being in you. We thank you that we are clothed in you. God, I rejoice in this gospel. I thank you that you so identified with sin that you had to be destroyed. And now you have identified us so much with righteousness. There are so many in this church who need to hear that and believe it, even this morning. Despite what I see in myself, God, I'm wrapped in an alien righteousness and accepted and loved and reconciled by the living Christ. God, let that be our treasure here this morning. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.